Welcome to this, the latest episode in the IA's Zero In series. With me, Saeed Kamal, I'm the Academic Research Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now in this series, we're joined by academics, business people, economists and others to discuss the UK's legal commitment to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Now as well as issues and solutions around the environmental agenda, from Pecuvian taxes on negative externalities to renewable energy transport heating, we also discuss the fundamental question of whether targets are necessary or achievable. Is it achievable by 2050? Is it the best way to clean up our planet? And what are the free market or least interventionist solutions? And what policy levers should be pulled? Now today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Anatole Lehman of Georgetown University, Qatar, Senior Fellow at the New America Foundation. His latest book is called Climate Change and the Nation State. Anatole, thank you very much for joining us today. I wonder whether we could start with the targets. Now, the UK government and the EU and other countries have set the target of achieving net zero carbon by the year 2050. What are your initial thoughts on the target itself? Are they realistic, achievable, and is this the best way to address concerns over the environment? Well, I think this target is technologically entirely achievable uh, on the assumption that uh, alternative energy and electric vehicles you know, make the progress in terms of efficiency and cost that we've seen over the past decade and more. So that is possible. Um, the questions, of course, are whether it's politically possible um, and the, you know, the, the costs to the economy. Here, though, the biggest uh, problems, I would say, are not for the developed economies, which can do this, I believe, you know, if they're prepared to ask for a certain amount of sacrifice from their populations. But of course, a much bigger question uh, revolves around um, developing economies um, led above all by India. I mean, whether India will be able to give up, um, especially dependence on coal for electricity generation. Uh, I mean, no doubt it can uh, over time, but you know, the, the question is whether it can do so quickly enough. I mean, when it comes to dates and targets, uh, this is, of course, a somewhat complex question because, you know, any target date and figure has to be more or less arbitrary. Like, you know, the, the much criticized figures of 2% and now 1.5% uh, um, by the IPCC for um, to the, the, the limits of uh, temperature rise. Uh, and of course, it also risks provoking despair if indeed it turns out that um, this target is not achievable. The, the point is, of course, that um, 2015, 2050 is not an end date. I mean, the struggle will have to continue after that. But nonetheless, um, I do believe that uh, target dates and figures are necessary um, because I think it has been pretty well established, um, not just in politics and, um, and economics, uh, but frankly, in our own lives as well, that if you don't set a specific target, it is very, very difficult um, to shape either uh, policies um, or indeed will uh, towards the, the ends which you have come to recognise are necessary. Um, now, when you talk about uh, this, you clearly mentioned the, the, the possible debate or discussion between the more developed nations and the less developed nations and developing nations. Let's, let's look and explore that a bit further. Um, how do you think we can convince those of us who are lucky enough or fortunate enough to live in the more developed countries? You know, how do we convince those developing countries who say, well, hold on a minute, you've been through your sort of smokestack part of your economic cycle. We haven't. How can we convince them to address, um, address the concerns that we have on climate change and set targets? Well, the point that I make in, in my book um, it is that in a great many cases, and above all, in the biggest case, India, you know, the, the, um, assuming that one regards China now as a developed economy, you know, by far the biggest developing economy is India, and of course by far the, the, the biggest developing emissions uh, are in India. Uh, and, but th this is not just true of India, it's true of Pakistan, of Bangladesh, it's true of large parts of Africa. The point is, that these countries are much more in danger 
than the developed world in the short to medium term, by which I mean you know, uh, until the end of this century, by climate change. Uh, you know, the, the way things stand, leaving aside the issue of migration, developed countries, for geographical reasons as well as economic and technological ones, um, will be able to avoid the really serious effects of climate change. I mean, you know, the apocalyptically serious consequences of climate change uh, in this century, or at least over the next couple of generations. But of course, if you're looking at countries which are already much closer to the edge in terms of temperatures uh, and in terms of the threat to agriculture from tr temperatures and drought, um, and are uh, especially, of course, close to the edge in terms of water stress. And if you add to those countries like Bangladesh, of course, first and foremost, um, which are the most endangered, even by limited uh, uh, low rises in, in sea levels. The, the point is that this shouldn't be thought of as, uh, you know, a, a, an unwilling sacrifice that these countries have to make. Uh, because of an agenda drawn up by the West. I mean, the, the whole point is that if things continue on their existing trajectory, the, the entire Indian dream of India becoming a developed economy and a world superpower by the middle of this century will be destroyed. Because by the middle of this century, the ecological damage and costs to India will be such uh, as to shatter any hope of that kind of economic progress. In addition, uh, even if India can somehow you know, manage to, to, to mobilize the ability to adapt to climate change, uh, you have two countries uh, on either side of India, Bangladesh, above all because of flooding, Pakistan, above all because of drought, uh, which risk, um, I mean, without exaggeration, uh, in the medium term already, um, being simply destroyed uh, by climate change. And of course, that sets off uh, a wave of, of mi migrants, uh, which would also pose a catastrophic threat to the Indian state. And another point I make in the book is that the, the issue of migration uh, has been overwhelmingly cast in terms of migration to the West. And you know, if you've got Western writers saying this, it's some um, understandable enough. Uh, but of course, that ignores the fact which, you know, anyone who knows anything of South Asian history or contemporary Indian politics should, should know. Um, that, that, of course, uh, a great many countries in the, developed, the developing world will also uh, be very, very seriously affected by migration. And, you know, if you look at the, um, the politics of the Modi government in India, you know, one can well see how that you know, can exacerbate uh, ethno-religious extremism, you know, how it can be exploited by chauvinist governments um, and lead to some you know, very, very tragic political outcomes. Yes, and I think it is fair to say when you speak to people in places like Pakistan, Bangladesh and other countries, they often think that people forget that they themselves host refugees. They may well have people leaving their countries to come to the West, but they are homes to uh, people who have fled persecution uh, in, in the, or other issues in neighbouring countries. I wonder, if I, could turn to, I wonder if I could turn to a fiscal tool that's been suggested, which is the idea of a carbon tax or other Pergovian taxes as a way of addressing the environmental agenda. Particularly, you know, Pergovian taxes to address negative externalities of carbon. Um, now, some think that's a really good idea, straightforward. Others think it's far too complicated and you can't really uh, target these taxes well, well enough. What are your views on these? Well, I mean, I am well aware that this is, you know, a very blunt instrument. Um, you know, and of course, I know all the objections to it. Uh, but the problem is that uh, almost any strategy one, ad one adopts uh, to try to, you know, reduce carbon emissions uh, by, you know, essentially putting pressure on markets is going to be a, a, a blunt strategy. Um, the, you know, obviously, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the aspects which is particularly troubling uh, is um, that people will simply, you know, manufacturers at least, will simply move uh, their emissions to 
other developing countries where standards are lower. And of course, uh, to a degree, we've already seen this. Uh, you know, as has often been pointed out, the, um, uh, the greater reductions in emissions on the part of developed economies to a considerable degree come from the fact uh, that, though not for this reason, uh, their manufacturing has moved to countries in, in Asia, um, which of course now have increased emissions as a result. Uh, now, uh, this I think will lead to something which of course has very unfortunate sides to it and will certainly increase international tension, uh, but especially in an atmosphere of increasing trade conflict, especially, of course, between the USA and China, but not only between them. Uh, I, I think that the inevitable price of carbon taxes and other forms of um, sacrifice uh, for lower emissions in the West uh, will be the imposition of higher tariffs uh, on manufacturing countries elsewhere, especially in Asia, uh, which will be explicitly linked to their progress or lack of it uh, in the area of reducing carbon emissions. Uh, as far as carbon taxes are concerned, um, I, you know, I recognize all the problems, but then you know, one, one has seen the problems with all the alternative strategies as well. Uh, I don't regard carbon taxes as a panacea, uh, but I, I, I do think that they will have to be part of the policy mix. I can't see any alternative to that um, when it comes to you know, increasing pressure and incentives in the market uh, for reduction of emissions. Not, not a solution in itself, but you know, part of the policy mix. Yeah, and I suppose when you say part of policy mix, so I think one of the concerns about quite often carbon taxes or, or green taxes or however they're labelled is that the people who are paying these taxes don't often see them being effect effectively hypothecated to be spent on carbon uh, reducing measures or more green measures. They just see it as part of the general uh, budget of a, of a government. And perhaps mm. if governments were smarter than demonstrating that this was used to address uh, environmental issues, then people might be more supportive. Yes, indeed. And um, you know, th that is why governments need to, uh, which is also part of my book, you know, really put climate change and reduction of emissions you know, at the heart of government policy and, frankly, you know, talk about it the whole time to the population in terms of national strategy, but also vital national interests. You know, in the long-term national survival, so that um, exactly measures adopted are seen by the population as directly linked to outcomes, uh, because otherwise, yes, you you get the um, you know the kind of reaction you know by the yellow vests in in France. Um, so I I entirely agree with you. This is a problem which must be addressed, and that that's also why in in the book I I talk about the need to um, describe climate change as a, a, you know, in the long run, a critical national security issue. Because, you know, if you look at issues of national security, governments talk to their populations the whole time about this. And uh, as a result, um, of course, whether correctly or not is another matter, um, but uh, manage to get their populations often to pay extraordinary levels of, of taxes, you know, an average of $2,000 a year paid by every US citizen um, for uh, the, the, the American armed forces, um, because they, they, they've been convinced that this is essential, you know, for, for the the well-being of the country. That is the kind of spirit that we need to cultivate. Well, I mentioned your book in the introduction and you've mentioned it a number of times. Could you, can we turn to your book now and, and essentially ask you, you know, what motivated you to write the book and what is the, the main thesis that flows through your book? Well, what motivated me really was um, the fact, well, really two things. Um, the, the first is that I spent a great deal of time in Pakistan um, and quite a time in, uh, in India as well and in Afghanistan, but mostly in Pakistan, uh, first as a journalist and then as a researcher. And you know, I also wrote a book about, about Pakistan. 
And you know, if you live in Pakistan and travel around and you know, visit parts of the countryside, um, you become vividly aware of the growing reality um, and the growing dangers, uh, especially when it, when it comes to water shortages and the effects on agriculture. Um, and you know, the, 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 these are not um, some kind of speculative future problems. You know, these are problems already which are bound to get worse. And you know, by most of the scientific predictions, catastrophically worse unless we manage to keep you know, climate change within reasonable bounds. Um, starting with a report of MIT um, three years ago, uh, you know, there's been a whole series of reports um, looking at the um, projected rises in temperature in South Asia and the Gulf, where I now live, um, which would have uh, you know, appalling consequences for South Asian agriculture. So that was one reason. Um, the second reason was that, you know, one of my other hats, I have a great many hats, but one of my principal hats is, is as an expert on security issues, international security. And, you know, the more I worked on questions like, you know, Russia's annexation of the Crimea uh, or China's uh, occupation of reefs and sandbanks in the South China Sea, uh, or indeed, um, the um, you know the security issues that obsess people uh, about the Persian Gulf, uh, the more these seemed, I mean, almost insignificant in the long run, compared to the the, the dangers of climate change to existing states. Um, that was particularly true. I had a kind of you know. Um, moment of St. Paul on the road to Damascus when I was thinking about those damned sandbanks in the South China Sea, because of course, uh, I mean, even with two degrees um, rise in temperatures, it seems overwhelmingly likely that they'll all be underwater again in a hundred years time. I mean, the issue will literally have gone away. Um, and so uh, I really felt that it, uh, I had a duty, you know, to try to I mean, do my small bit to refocus people's attention, you know, on what I took to be the greatest threat to humanity. And not just to humanity, but specifically to you know, the, the, the national interests and in the long run national existence of, ex of existing states. And I, I was also um, motivated uh, in this by the fact that I was trained as a historian um, of 20th century Europe um, at Cambridge. And it, it seemed to me that historians of the future, 100 years, 200 years from now, assuming there are any, um, would look back at our present security priorities in much the same way that we look back at the, um, the, the national elites of Europe in the years leading to the First World War. And they will say, how could these people have got it so totally wrong? You know, just as we say about the, the leaders of Europe um, before 1914, how could they have thought that, uh, you, you know, it was the, um, the, the threat of the German Empire to the Russian Empire or the British Empire to the German Empire, uh, which was the greatest threat facing these states, compared, of course, particularly in the case of Russia, uh, to the threat of internal revolution and internal collapse, which first in the form of communism and then in the form of Nazism was what, you know, uh, well, because of the First World War, brought um, those states and the old European order down in ruins and very nearly destroyed European civilization. So that, that was my, my personal motivation for writing this book. And what and what is you know, the thesis? You know, what 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 is, what is the story or or the or the issue or, how, or you address in the book? I mean, we know the issue is clearly climate change in the nation state, as it says on the cover. But you know, what is your your your, your general thesis? Well, the the first thesis and argument is, you know, as I've said, it's an attempt to persuade national security elites uh, that climate change risks the. Uh, well, 
inevitable terrible damage uh, to their states and the national security of their states. And if unchecked, um, it, you know, it does pose a serious risk of the destruction of those states. I mean, if one, God forbid, gets into um, a feedback loop, you know, whereby three degrees turns into four degrees, turns into five degrees, then no contemporary state, no organized society will survive. Um, and so I wanted to bring that home. Now, out of that uh, comes another argument, um, which, uh, as you can imagine, is, is pretty controversial uh, on the, the left today, um, but which is about the possibility of mobilizing nationalism. I mean, moderate civic nationalism or patriotism, to give it a nicer word, uh, behind the struggle to limit emissions and to limit climate change. Uh, in other words, to persuade populations uh, that, I mean, of course, this is a threat to humanity in general, um, you know, uh, and to the planet, uh, but it is also specifically a threat to your countries, uh, which you need to regard um, as in the past and up to now, you have regarded real or alleged threats from, you know, other great powers from terrorism and so forth. So that's the second part of the argument. Um, the third part of the argument uh, is that um, the existing environmentalist camp um, and uh, you know the, the, the camp of um, anti-climate change activists and green parties should really prioritize climate change. Um, because, of course, they say that they're doing that, but unfortunately, uh, many of their own agendas um, do not actually reflect that. Um, you know, ju just as our uh, national governments and security elites, you know, talk the talk about climate change being a threat, and, and then, you know, once again, they, they go off and, and worry about the Spratly Islands, you know, or, or the Donbass, you know, or uh, the, you know, the, the, the alleged Iranian threat to Middle East peace, as if, my God, we haven't done enough damage to that, you know, ourselves. Um, but the environmentalist camp also is guilty in this regard. You know, if you, if you read their agendas, Green Party agendas, for example, uh, you will find them loading onto it uh, a whole set of... Um, economic, social, and cultural agendas, which not merely have nothing to do with climate change, but in two instances, are actually very damaging uh, to the struggle to limit climate change. Uh, the first general one uh, is that they alienate conservative voters, moderate conservative voters, uh, whom it is absolutely essential to win over if you're going to get the kind of consensus which is necessary uh, to adopt, push through and maintain the measures necessary um, to move towards uh, zero carbon by 2050. I mean, this is a massive project and it is going to involve really serious and wrenching economic change and a good deal of sacrifice. I mean, for that, you've got to convince basically, I mean, not, not nations as a whole, but, you know, re real national consensus of the kind that have come together in the past, you know, behind the welfare state, you know, where the whole of the political spectrum in, in Europe, you know, minus some wild extremists on the right, accepts this as necessary, you know, or, or issues of national security. Um, so that's the first um, reason, you know, really to focus your agenda on climate change and carbon emissions. Uh, oh, oh, and by the way, I mean, not also turn this into um, a, a crusade against capitalism in general, which so many of them do. Um, uh, because I make the point in, in the book, both that, you know, socialist regimes have been, you know, just as bad or often much worse, you know, when it comes to um, carbon emissions, pollution, and so forth. Um, but also that if you are going to predicate serious action uh, against climate change on the destruction of capitalism, well, 
you are going to wait, you're going to have to wait until it is far too late um, to do anything serious about it. Now, then, of course, you will get the destruction of capitalism, but you'll get the destruction of everything else as well, you know, if you wait for the, that. Um, on a more specific point, I argue very strongly um, that if indeed you prioritize uh, reduction in car carbon emissions, then it is simply lunatic to link that to the immediate abolition of existing nuclear energy. Um, those are two diametrically opposed agendas. Um, when the French Green Party uh, links um, uh, in its program, uh, the complete um, end to carbon emissions by, I think it was 2030, with the immediate abandonment of all nuclear power, which, of course, in France, more than anywhere else, even in France, it um, uh, accounts for about 80% of French electricity um, generation. Well, I mean, if that agenda were implemented, you would do exactly what the climate change deniers or the opponents of climate change action uh, say is the inevitable consequence of any action. You would plunge France into the dark. You know, you, you would ruin the French economy. It simply cannot be done. But I mean, on a lesser scale, we've already seen uh, in Germany the panicky decision to abandon nuclear power after the Fukushima uh, accident, which wasn't, by the way, a disaster. I mean, the, the terribly loose and, and lax you know, hysterical use of language here. Um, but this German uh, abandonment of, of nuclear energy has been directly responsible, uh, in large part, um, for Germany's failure to meet its previous targets um, for ending uh, coal-based electricity generation. Um, which, of course, it, it's not just that um, th th this is disastrous from the point of view of action against climate change, uh, but it's also, it, it, it's one of these cases where, you know, people have simply not sat down and rationally assessed the risks. Uh, so um, that's a, a kind of specific thing as well, where the, um, the environmentalist camp, you know, has failed really to do what it claims to do uh, and prioritise action against carbon emissions. And that reminds me of a number of issues. I remember when I was in the European Parliament, and I think it was 2014, I asked one of the French Green MEPs, what's your priority for the next five years? And he said to me, to stop TTIP, you know, the EU-US uh, trade agreement. And I said to him, but what's that got to do with the, the green issues and, and the environmental concerns that, you, you, that we all have? And he said, no, no, this is our, this is our priority. And, um, mm -hmm. and, I, I, and also, I remember during one of the Extinction Rebellion um, marches recently in London, when I saw, you know, for example, recycling trucks being blocked, um, uh, protesters were blocking my cycle lane. And I said, I had a conversation. I said, well, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing environmentally by cycling. You're blocking my cycle lane, but you're also trying to stop people using public transport. You know, what is it? And I think, I suppose, uh, the question I really want to come to is, why do you think there are so many people in the environmental movement, you know, across the spectrum of the environmental movement? who are not so keen on building a coalition, as you say, with across the spectrum for this, but want to attack capitalism and think capitalism is the enemy as opposed to part of the solution? Well, uh, in part, of course, it is simply, you know, the, the old hard left, which has, you know, seen all its other, uh, you know, hopes fail, basically. Um, and you know, one, one sees this also in some of the, you know, the, the cultural left issues and, uh, frankly, has looked for other you know, revolutionary um, strategies to, to adopt. Um, and, you know, an, an, a, a, a very rapid uh, elimination um, of uh, all carbon-based um, fuels uh, would <laughs> indeed um, destroy capitalism. The point is it's not going to happen. You know, that is simply, you know, not going to happen. It's, it's another totally false, you know, avenue. Um, but I think, um, I, I think as well, um, where there is a fundamental problem with capitalism and certainly with, you know, consumerist capitalism, sort of retail capitalism, 
you know, as it has grown up in recent generations. Um, but which also creates, uh, you know, a, a psychological hostility to, um, to capitalism, you know, in, in, including uh, among a good many, you know, religious conservatives, by the way, you know, um, rather than, you know, free market liberals calling themselves conservatives. It is this business of materialism, of, uh, you know, unending and escalating competitive consumption. Uh, and um, you know, the, a real question, of course, whether uh, economies, but also cultures structured uh, along these lines, are capable, will be capable, of making e even, you know, the limited sacrifices which will be required in my view, you know, if we are to, to move away from carbon emissions in the time available. Um, you know, what one sees that very much um, the yellow vest protests, you know, in, um, in, in France. Um, carbon taxes, you know, will have that effect, fuel taxes, um, limitations on air travel. Uh, so I think, you know, that, that is um, another motive. Uh, I mean, I should say that the, you know, the final argument for my book, however, is um, it's an argument for uh, some form of um, Green New Deal, different forms of Green New Deal in different countries, um, simply because, uh, and I think the Yellow Vest protests also did demonstrate this, um, it will be impossible to ask populations uh, to make higher sacrifices uh, you know, in, in the campaign to limit emissions unless there is a real sense of enhanced social solidarity. Um, and also, I mean, unless there are specifically targeted strategies of trying to boost employment uh, in particular areas uh, to compensate for the, um, the jobs which will inevitably be lost as a result of the move away from carbon emissions. Um, and I link this to um, a slightly different point, which is that um, not only from climate change, or in fact earlier than climate change, but you know, we are going to see um, increased social and economic pressures on populations in the decades to come. Uh, from automation, AI, very likely, uh, possibly increased as a result of the, the effects of the pandemic. Uh, and of course, even before climate change migration kicks in, um, you know, from migration. And, you know, unless we can find ways, you know, really to pull our societies together again, um, you know, we do risk going down the, the, the American path. I mean, they haven't gone very far down that path yet, but, you know, as one can see, you know, from the pictures, it's dangerous enough, whereby you get societies and political systems which become so embittered and so polarised that, that, frankly, they're no longer capable of agreeing on anything. And um, my, you know, experience of Pakistan, you know, has, has also... Um, you know, made me particularly sensitive to this. You, you know, you when you have a polity which you know simply cannot summon up, a, you know, a sufficient national consensus uh, to push through, you know, necessary changes, um, and for the same reason, of course, can't summon up you know sufficient national will and consensus uh, to get populations to accept those changes. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's a threat which faces us all if, if we cannot, um, as I say, you know, pull our, our political systems back together behind, um, uh, you know, a national consensus on social policy as well as ecological policy uh, of a kind which, once again, you know, we did achieve um, in mid-century uh, with the creation of welfare states, um, the New Deal in America, welfare states in Europe. Um, and of course, that was because um, that, that was, you know, not by any means simply a, uh, you know, a, a left-wing agenda. Um, conservative parties also accepted this was absolutely necessary uh, if social collapse and revolution were to be prevented. Now, before I, I kind of sum up, there's, here's one issue I do want to address, which is 
Um, you spoke about nuclear, and we obviously see some developments in nuclear technology, uh, uh, small module reactors. We see these, uh, some hopeful signs of fusion as opposed to fission. Um, but also, you know, you've spoke about AI and automation. Do you think in addressing the problems of climate change and environmental problems, we underestimate the, the uh, extent of human ingenuity and innovation? Um, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist in sort of, uh, humans, and when they're faced with a problem, I think that we will come together and solve it. But am I being overly optimistic? I mean, or or do, we, do we sometimes not pay enough attention to human ingenuity? Well, uh, I also actually have great confidence in human ingenuity. And, you know, that, that's also why I said that technologically speaking, uh, I'm convinced that it will be possible uh, to um, reduce carbon emissions, or rather it would be possible to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050. Um, and, uh, you know, a whole uh, set of different areas, you know, in, including, of course, carbon capture. But I think if you look at the, um, at the past and Geopolitical competition, you know, even short of war, is is rather you know interesting and important from this point of view. Uh, that so often, I mean, no doubt these technological changes, you know, would have been adopted simply by the free market sooner or later. But one does see, if one looks, you know, to the past, including even in the United States, you know, how the rapid adoption of new technologies, development and adoption, was often very much driven uh, and led by state action and encouragement. You know, and that was true, by the way, from the spread of railways on. You know, in continental Europe, um, and India, by the way, um, railways were very much developed by states for military strategic purposes. Uh, but in America, too, I mean, if you look at, um, you, you know, the, de the development of American technology, very much encouraged by the state in general and the Pentagon in particular in the 1950s uh, as part of the competition with the Soviet Union, um, you know, this laid the basis of, you know, much of America's technological development and technological lead up to this day, including, of course, most notably computers and the Internet, so that... Um, I, I have great faith in human uh, ingenuity, uh, but I think the lesson of history is that states also have to give it a push. And, uh, you know, if you look at the example of China, we haven't talked about China, but of course, you know, China is of, um, well, actually the most important state from this point of view. Uh, the, the Chinese are you know, deeply convinced of their own ingenuity, but they, you know, their whole strategy is based on the idea um, that the state, you know, has to push, has to lead, has to lay down targets, and then, you know, damn well try to make sure that the economy and the society move towards them. Now, Anatoly, this has been a fascinating conversation. In summing up to, at the moment, how would you say, or what thought would you like to leave with our readers? It could be a plug for your book, or it could just be a thought that you want, you know, if anyone's listened to this podcast, what thought or idea do you want them to take away? Well, the, the, the cover of my book, which I, I actually proposed myself and Penguin accepted, comes from the old Second World War uh, poster um, about social mobilization and the mobilization of women in particular. Sorry, it's back to front, but people know this poster. And the slogan is, we can do it. You know, in other words, you know, don't despair. Um, you know, we, we have the capacity of, as states and societies uh, to hack this. Um, but, you know, we have to think about it hard. We have to have the will. Um, and we have to be prepared to make certain sacrifices, as during the Second World War. Well, Professor Anatole Levin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Professor Levin's book, Climate Change in the Nation State, is available, I'm sure, at all good booksellers and online and offline as well. Uh, can I thank you uh, for watching or listening today? Don't forget to check out our previous episodes in this series. Uh, they're all on our YouTube channel, IA London. You can also listen to them on Podbean. Um, and I, I, I really, um, if you would like to suggest other speakers or other ideas for this series, please do get in touch. You can find all our other online content at ia.org.uk. Thank you for watching or listening today, and I hope that you'll be able to join us again soon.